The word gospel translates to news that brings joy. But this isn't just any news. A gospel is news that changes a life forever. After being invaded and enslaved by Persia, Greece won two decisive battles at Marathon and Solnes. The Greeks sent out heralds, also called evangelists, to proclaim the good news to the cities. We have fought for you, we have won, and now you're no longer slaves, you're free. The reality is that we are all slaves, slaves to sin and slaves to death. We are slaves in need of good news. Enter Jesus, God's Son, fully God, fully man, bringing news that would change our lives forever. His news was this, I am the divine, come to you to do what you could not do for yourself. I will take what you deserve so you can have what I deserve. You have no idea how much it will cost me, but you also cannot imagine the depths of my love for you. It is a gift that I give freely. So repent. Repent from all the ways you've run from me and follow me. Follow me because I am the only way to eternal life. Follow me because I'm the Savior you've been looking for. Follow me because I have authority over everything, yet I have humbled myself for you. Follow me because I died on a cross for you, because I'm your true love and your true life. This is my good news for you. This is my gospel, that you have been saved by grace and that you are slaves no more. Good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Taylor Scott and these are your Trinity Unity announcements. There will be a board meeting this Sunday at 1 p.m. The Zoom information has been sent out via email. Trinity Worship Center announcements. Come and join us on July 19, 2020 at 6 p.m. for Your Vote, Your Power, where guest speakers will be William Winston, Larry Johnson, Adonahue Baker, Melvin Preston, Daryl S. Anderson, Calvin Preston, Mayor Ollie Clemens, and Mr. David Howard. A message from the Grief Recovery Ministry. I pray this message will offer some encouragement to you. Having a birthday is a big deal these days. Recently, I praise God for celebrating my own beyond my expectations. There are others who unfortunately have experienced loss of loved ones. Communicate joyfully and peacefully with friends and family often. Life is uncertain, but we are assured that our loving God is with us. Reading Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 14 is recommended. There will be a board meeting held this Sunday at 10 a.m. The Zoom information has been emailed out from the clerk's email. Trinity Unity Prayer Meeting will be held every Tuesday at 7 p.m. The Zoom link will be sent out in weekly emails. Please join in the comfort of your home and forward the invite to your friends and family. Thank you and happy Sabbath. Hey sis, dad, mom, come on. It's time for your story hour. Good morning everyone, I'm Uncle Eric. And I'm Aunt Monica. And today's story will be... Hey, aren't we supposed to be doing the welcome? Vivi, I believe you're right. Does anybody have anything? <laughs> Me? Zay, what do you have? I have a song. Give it to us. There's no place like this place, so this must be the place. 
The Lord woke you up this morning and sent you our way. I hope you find peace, I hope you find joy, I hope you find everything you're looking for. What a fellowship, doom, 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 doom. What a joy divine, dun, 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 dun. This must be the right place at the right time. To the Unity and Trinity Worship Center, family, friends, and guests, welcome to our divine worship service. We are the Lamb family, and we hope you have a happy Sabbath. Good morning, happy Sabbath. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We welcome each and every one of you who have joined us today via Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, Venmo, and any other device in which you're uh, with us. We are privileged to have you. We realize that there's so many other churches that you could have tuned into today, but the fact that you chose to be with us, it means so much to us here at Trinity and at Unity. And so we welcome you. We want to just highlight a few announcements this morning, as you just heard. Uh, first of all, we want to thank Brother Dwayne Pettis for leading us so wonderfully in our Sabbath School discussion this morning. And we do want to give uh, God thanks for him and for all of you for your input. Um, please continue to keep our sick in sh and shutting in your prayers. Um, Sister Hattie, thank God, is out of the hospital. She's home. And we need you to continue to lift her up in prayer as she heals and recovers. Also, uh, mention brother and sister Shine in your prayers as they're going through various health challenges. Um, we want you to remember Sister Sandra Jones as she's healing and, and getting her strength. And Sister Vernell Frederick's dad. The list is long of those who need prayer and attention. They need the attention of the Lord right now. Uh, but we do believe in the power of prayer. And so we want to unite together in praying for these individuals. Um, also, you do not want to miss this week's prayer meeting. This week's prayer meeting is so good that I can't wait till Tuesday to have it. We're going to do it on Monday, all right? And so this week's prayer meeting will not be on Tuesday as, our, as we rec normally do it. It will be on Monday at 7 o'clock p.m. You don't want to hear about this secondhand. You want to be there. And I would advise you to bring a notepad and some, a pen or a writing utensil uh, because this will be very informative about where we are in the prophetic line and how soon Jesus is to come. And Jesus is coming soon. Um, and you want to be there on Monday evening at 7, at 7 o'clock p.m. The Zoom link will be sent shortly to join us for prayer meeting. As was announced, we do have board meeting tomorrow. Trinity, your board meeting is at 10 o'clock a.m. Unity, our board meeting is at 1 o'clock p.m. And so please be there. Zoom link will be sent out today. And uh, let me close with some good news. We want to welcome the newest addition to the Ledbetter family, um, Shiloh Lennox Mobley. He was uh, born last night, 9.16 p.m., 8 pounds, 0 ounces. That's grandchild number 9. And so we welcome the growing Ledbetter clan. Amen. Uh, we also want to say happy birthday, happy belated birthday to Elder Tyrone Ledbetter, who celebrated his birthday yesterday. Please follow us on social media if you want all the updates and announcements of what's going on at Unity and at Trinity. You can follow us. You can download our app. It's free of charge, TWCSDA. On there, you would get announcements. We have archived sermons and other good material that you can use. Also, visit our website, TWCSDA.org. And for Charlotte, it is charlotteunitysda.com. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us today. We know that God is going to bless you as we worship together in spirit and in truth. May God richly bless you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Come on, Praise everybody, the under the sound of my voice. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise, Praise the, the Lord. Lord. Psalm 95, 3 and 7 says, For the Lord is a mighty God, a mighty king all over the world. 
He rules over the world and the earth, from the deepest caves to the highest hills. He rules over the seas which he made, and also the land which he made himself. Come let us bow down and worship him, for he is a mighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We serve a mighty God. We serve a holy God. We serve an awesome God. My Savior, my Savior. We serve a mighty God. We serve a holy God. We serve an awesome God.
Good morning. It is prayer time. So thankful for unity and Trinity and all of our visiting friends. Shall we approach the throne of heaven together? Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, we just appreciate how you've always been there for us. Lord, making a way out of what seems to be no way. Father, through these tough times, Father, when some have lost loved ones, Lord, others are going through sickness. Father, some are going through loss of jobs. Father, this is a time when we as believers have to exercise this powerful means called prayer. And so, Lord, we are coming now together as one, approaching your throne, Lord, seeking our help from on high in this time of need. But Lord, there are also others who have experienced blessings, who have experienced you making a way out of what seemed to be no way, who have seen you heal those who have been sick. Lord, there are those who have gotten jobs that they know that they should not have gotten. Lord, there have been good news in the midst of all of this bad news. And so we want to praise you because it's not all bad. Lord, you are all good. And so therefore, even in this time of turmoil and death and all of the disease and issues that we see in the world today, we see that glimmer of hope because we have this hope that one day, Lord, you're going to come back you're going to take us away from all this mess, and we're going to live with you through the ceaseless ages. And so, Father, we, we choose to focus on that. We choose to focus on the life to come, because this mere 60, 70 years, Lord, is but just a vapor. And so let us not lose sight of eternity trying to hold on to this temporary thing that we call life. So, Lord, we thank you for life everlasting in your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we just pray that we will be that witness that you've called us to be, that we will stand with courage, and that we will seek you and your kingdom. And we thank you, Father, for just being with us today. We thank you, Lord, for blessing the service thus far. We, Lord, we want to lift up the man of God, Lord, who we know has a word from on high. So, Father, we pray that we have ears to hear and that we will truly take heed to the call that you've given your manservant this day. Thank you so much, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayer. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name.
Father, that's our prayer today. That our answer is yes to your will, yes to your way. Yes, every day. We submit to you, your leading hand, your providing hand, your guiding hand. Lord, as we open the pages of sacred scripture, we do pray for your Holy Spirit to come and flex his muscles in this room. But then we pray that you'd move through the airways and go into the homes and the hearts of every individual who is watching and listening to this today. We pray that you would fall in copious measures and let us experience you afresh and let your word revive us anew. Lord, I pray for the anointing that makes preaching easy. Let your saints be edified through your word today. And we will be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory in this. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever and evermore. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you to our praise team and to our band for blessing our hearts and souls so wonderfully with the music of today, one of my favorite songs, God Wants a Yes. And let me invite you to take your Bibles wherever you are, in your homes, in your car. Just pick your Bible up with me as we declare and give the devil a headache. This is my Bible. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is my GPS, my godly positioning system. Jesus loves me, this I know, for this Bible tells me so. The Bible says that I'm the over and not the under. The Bible says that I'm the head and not the tail. The Bible says that I'm the lender and not the borrower. The Bible says that the word of the Lord is the sword of the spirit. So devil, you better don't mess with me today because I'm armed and dangerous. Amen, amen, amen. Give God praise today. Today I want to invite you to journey with me to the New Testament gospel according to Matthew. Matthew, and there I want us to highlight chapter 5. Today we begin a sermon series that I will title Attitude Adjustment. And we're going to be studying the Beatitudes and even the Sermon on the Mount. So we start today with Matthew chapter 5, and there I want us to settle down in the first three verses. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read to you from the English Standard Version of the Bible. And the Word of God says, Seeing the crowds, he, Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, for emphasis, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want to speak to you today under the topic, stimulus check. Let us pray. Almighty Father and our God, today... Speak now, for your servants are listening. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the subject that I want us to wrestle with this afternoon is how to receive an eternal stimulus check. Uh, I know many of us have been blessed, uh, not all of us, but some of us, with our government stimulus check, and we were so happy uh, when that thing came. Today, I want to talk about how to receive an eternal stimulus check. Uh, it was the late, great Christopher Wallace, also known as the notorious B.I.G., also known as Biggie Smalls, who uh, was an old rapper from Brooklyn who once said in his hit single entitled, More Money, More Problems, he said, I don't know what they want from me. It's like the more money we come across, the more problems we see. <laughs> And this gives us a glimpse into the life of someone who grew up in poverty, 
someone who grew up hustling on the streets of New York. He grew up selling drugs just to keep diapers on his daughter. Grew up getting locked up, but finally he made it financially and he had reached the pinnacle of success. No longer was he rapping on street corners, but now he's in the studio making albums and going on tour. He was earning more money than many of us would know how to spend, but the more he earned is the more he learned more money it brings more problems. And uh, it is through this life and through this phrase that causes me to Consider the fact that all that glitters is not gold. Firstly, all that glitters is not gold because the Bible teaches us that to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, but furthermore, all that glitters is not gold because the more money you tend to have is the more you tend to worry about protecting it. And so many of us, we see those who are wealthy and affluent, and sometimes we tend to wish that we had all the money and the cars and the houses and the clothes and the resources that they had. But many folk who are filthy rich are looking at you and wishing that they had the peace of mind that you have. They wish that they had the restful sleep that you had last night. Because the fact of the matter is that all that glitters is not gold. And this pandemic has taught us, if it has taught us anything, it is that money can be here today and gone tomorrow. Your job security can be here today and gone tomorrow. Your savings can be here today and gone tomorrow. Your friends can be here today and gone tomorrow. Life as you know it can be here today but gone tomorrow. And there are those of us who would sacrifice our family. We will sacrifice our relationships uh, and some of us would even sacrifice our standing with God just to earn one million. But understand beloved that all the money in the world cannot provide happiness. There are many billionaires and that, that are that are that are depressed and that 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 are that are going through uh, suicidal tendencies and inclinations because not all that glitters is gold. And I don't know if Biggie knew the scriptures or if he ever considered Jesus' first beatitude that suggests that one can simultaneously watch this be blessed or happy and poor. Jesus had just finished experiencing the beauty of baptism. He experienced a public demonstration of the infilling of the Holy Ghost who descended from heaven in the form of a dove. He had just heard the voice of God declaring from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And after that, Jesus had the wilderness experience where he was led by the Holy Spirit to go into the wilderness and fast for 40 days and 40 nights. And there he was tempted by the devil. Uh, notice, if you will, with me, beloved, that Jesus went straight from the baptismal pool to the frying pan. And I want to let you know that your Christian journey will be filled with high mountains and low valleys. The Christian journey is never one that is linear. It is one that you're going to have some ups and you're going to have some downs. But you've got to remember in order to make it from day to day, in order to survive your storms and your sicknesses and your pandemics and your epidemics, in order to survive your, your, your financial turbulences, in order to survive distractions and detours and dead ends you've got to understand that the God on the mountain is still God in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right the God of the good times is still God in the bad times the God of the day is still God in the night and so Jesus moving from the baptistry to the temptation of the wilderness shows us that every time you draw closer to God the devil is near to tempt test and annoy but thank God that Jesus did not yield to the temptation of the enemy. After this episode of demonic temptations, Jesus now begins to designate and assign disciples who will follow after him and learn from him. And it's important for us today to understand and notice the type of men that Jesus picked out. Because Jesus picked out men that people would not expect to be hanging out with the Messiah. He picked out men that were not the type of individuals that we will nominate to sit on our elders board, deacons board, or even our ushers board. 
board. Th these weren't your average well-dressed Sabbath uh, morning Bible quoting scripture quoting type of men. These were some rough dirty, cursing, lying, unkept individuals uh, who if a poll were taken uh, about them, they would be regarded as unworthy, unfit, and unqualified to be hanging out with Jesus. But I thank God that God is not like man uh, and while man gets stuck on the outward appearances and the external realities, uh, God has a vision that is able to penetrate uh, the shirt and the tie and the long skirt. Uh, he he doesn't just, he doesn't turn us away because of our, our inadequacies. He doesn't turn us away because of our insufficiencies. He doesn't turn us away because of our unpreparedness or disqualifying characteristics. God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies who he calls. And so the Bible says that after seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up into a mountain. And when he sat down, he began to teach. And I want you to notice today that the Sermon on the Mount was not for everybody. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount was not typically at the time directed for the multitudes. This was not necessarily an inclusive sermon. It was an exclusive sermon. You see, Jesus separated himself from the crowds and from the multitudes. He went up the mountain and began to preach to his disciples and I want to declare that if ever a person is not a disciple or a follower of Christ then they would have a very hard time understanding and applying the Sermon on the Mount. The sermon is constructed for those of us who plan to one day walk on streets of gold. This, this sermon is constructed for those of us who plan to one day skate on a sea of glass. And it's constructed for those of us who plan to see the lion and the lamb laid together. For those of us who plan to, to, to eat from the tree that bears 12 different fruit. This sermon is not for everybody. It's for those who realize that we are pilgrims and we are strangers. We, this is not our final home. We're just kind of passing through. The, the application of this sermon is designated only for disciples or followers of Christ. And so I pause here parenthetically to ask you, are you a follower of Christ? And allow me to paint the picture for your intellectual imagination. Uh, notice, if you will, that Jesus sat down. He, he took the posture of a teacher because in those days, the teacher would often sit and the students would stand. Nowadays, uh, the preacher stands and the, and the students sit, but that's not the way it was in Jesus' day. The teachers would sit and the students would stand. And Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1 says when he was set, meaning sitting down or settled down or, or comfortable because uh, back in those days, those who were listening to the teachings and the words of God were not clock watchers. They were not telling the pastor your sermon was too long. They, they just wanted more and more that God had to give them. And so the teacher sat down. He got comfortable while the students stood up. So that when he was going on too long, they could just leave. Amen. Uh, and so the Bible says that when he was sit, he was sitting down. Luke's rendition of the Sermon on the Mount recorded in Luke 6 and 20 says that he, Jesus, lifted up his eyes to the disciples. He lifted up his eyes because he was sitting while they were standing. And as Jesus begins to teach this first portion of the Sermon on the Mount, it is known as the Beatitudes. It's known as the blessings. The, the literal definition of the word Beatitude is supreme blessedness and exalted happiness. All right. The, the, let me give you that again. The, the, the definition of the word beatitude is supreme blessedness and exalted happiness. But it can also be understood as giving the believers his beatitudes, watch this, or the attitudes that he or she should be. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in the Beatitudes, Jesus identifies the character of kingdom citizens. In the Beatitudes, Jesus identifies the aspiration of kingdom citizens. He identifies the goals of Christian citizens. He identifies the nature of Christian citizens because you've got to understand that if you meet someone who claims to be a Christian but does not display and desires not to display any of the traits of character listed in these beatitudes, you might have a good reason to wonder about their salvation. But if you run into someone who claims to have mastered these characteristics, you have to question their honesty. 
So the Beatitudes, they're constructed like Proverbs. In other words, they are short, meaningful statements strung together by a common theme. And each of the Beatitudes have three parts. Uh, they start with the word blessed, which again means to be happy or supreme blessedness, exalted happiness. And they describe a particular characteristic and they end with an appropriate blessing. All right. For those who are taking notes, let me give you that again. They start with the word blessed. It means exalted happiness and supreme blessedness and then they describe an appropriate blessing and and, and then, uh, excuse me they describe a particular characteristic and they end with an appropriate blessing and so the beatitudes are really don't have don't describe eight different kinds of people i need you to get that today the beatitudes are not multiple choice it is not that they describe eight different characteristics and you could choose the one that best fits you no, that's not what the Beatitudes are. They describe the characteristics that every child of God who wants to be saved must obtain. One author, Kay Hinckley, puts it this way. He says, the Beatitudes aren't isolated virtues. They are landmarks along the path of repentance that leads us near to the heart of God. So our introductory word is blessed. It is taken from the Greek word makarios, which means it's also understood as fortunate or happy. But, but we dare not limit this concept of being blessed to only a state of happiness that is temporary, that the world gives. But the blessings pronounced in these biblical beatitudes indicate a favorable spiritual state that the Christian has due to the approval of God. And how many of us know that we have found favor in the sight of God? How many of us know that God looks beyond your faults uh, and he sees your needs uh, and the favor of God is not temporary happiness like what the things of the world gives uh, neither is the favor of God dependent on physical or external circumstances uh, the favor of God gives us peace uh, in the midst of storms the favor of God it gives us hope uh, when things look hopeless the favor of God allows you to see blessings uh, despite what is going on around us the favor of God it lets you see things not in the natural but in the spiritual your ancestors understood the favor of God when they were out in the cotton fields picking cotton with the sun beaming on them and no shoes on their feet and their hands were blistered from picking the cotton but yet and still they didn't see their situation in the natural they saw it in the spirit and said I got shoes and you got shoes and all God's children got shoes and when I get to heaven I'm going to put on my shoes and walk all over God's heaven they couldn't see it in the natural but they saw it in the spiritual that's favor so even when I cry and mourn I notice the blessings of God's favor even when I'm hungry or thirsty I notice the blessings of God's favor even when I'm experiencing persecution trials and turbulences of life and uh, still I notice the blessings of divine favor of God in my life and so notice the first beatitude Recorded in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The clear word puts it this way. Happiness comes from the right attitude. Hmm. If you feel your need of God and trust him, then you have the kingdom of God within you. <laughs> the first beatitude is an appropriate introduction for the Sermon on the Mount because... It introduces Jesus' theme, which is the kingdom of heaven. The first beatitude sets the tone for the entire Sermon on the Mount. The idea of being poor in spirit has its roots in the Old Testament and continues to saturate the New Testament because God's people are always oppressed. They often found themselves in material poverty and always asking God to give them help and sustenance. And so poverty was often associated with humility and dependence on God. For example, Psalm 34 and 6 says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. Proverbs 16, 19 and 20 says, Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. He that handleth the matter wisely shall find good, and whosoever tr trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. 
He has set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty of the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel, watch this, to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now, as we climb down this homiletical mountain today, I, I've intentionally homiletically drove your attention uh, to the idea of financial poverty in the construction of this text. But when you take a closer look at the text, you discover that Jesus was not describing individuals who are blissfully happy in poverty. He was not referring to those who are economically disadvantaged. He was not indicating that those who are desperately dependent on bailouts and stimulus checks, uh, that the, the poverty of which Jesus of, was speaking of is not financial poverty, but watch this, spiritual poverty. The Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, fortunate are the poor in spirit. In other words, watch this, happy are the poor in spirit. Uh, this, this is what we call in theology a, uh, a, a word contrast or, 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 or we call it a paradox or, or some may even call it an oxymoron. Uh, it causes us to face the conundrum that in order, watch this, in order to be eligible for that eternal stimulus check, you must first be spiritually dependent. Lord, help us. Uh, so, so what does it, does it mean to be poor in spirit? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, it does not mean hating yourself or feeling as if you have no value. It, it does not mean weak faith or false humility, humility. And watch this. It does not mean being financially broke. No, no, no. To be poor in spirit, simply put, is when you recognize your own spiritual bankruptcy. No, no, one, no one can participate in the kingdom or expect to be numbered in the number of the redeemed if they have not recognized their own desperate need for God and the fact that they cannot overcome this issue on their own. So how do you know, how do you know that you're not yet poor in spirit? You know you're not poor in spirit when you're rich in worry. When you, when, you, when you have an incurable problem, you realize that entertainment can't fix it and education can't fix it and economics can't fix it. You need a power that is more powerful than your problem. And that's why Jesus said that we must enter as little children. Because if one thing little children know is that they are dependent, they need, the, they need somebody that is more powerful than this situation. Somebody that can lift them up and feed them and clothe them and shelter them. They, they, Jesus says you've got to come as a little child. Uh, they're trusting, they're forgiving, they're, they're dependent. Ch little children are poor. I don't care how rich they think they are. I was talking to one of my goddaughters this week. She said, I'm a princess. And I said, child, you poor. You ain't no princess. You, you a pauper. Uh, but, but, but the child realizes their need for somebody bigger. The rich, on the other hand, the self-sufficient, will have a difficult time entering the kingdom of God. And that's the problem with people living in these last days, is that we have so much that we don't think we need anything from God. As a matter of fact, Roman, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. In other words, Christ was saying more money, more problems. But the poor, the sinful, and the destitute see their need clearly and they run to God freely. One of my favorite passages of scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. And I want to read this to you today from the New International Translation of the Bible. And it puts it this way, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. It says, to keep me, Paul is writing, he says, to keep me from becoming conceited uh -huh, because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. And look what Paul said in verse 8. He said, three times 
I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Oh, but this ought to make somebody shout in here today. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, beloved, your weakness is the power that activates God's grace. Therefore, Paul said, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. And that is why, for Christ's sake, look what Paul says. He says, I delight in my weaknesses, in my insults, in my hardships, in my persecutions, in my difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I'm down, then I can lift, lift, my, lift my eyes to the hills uh, and I can say, Father, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. The Bible says uh, that he gave Paul a thorn in the flesh uh, so that he wouldn't be arrogant or conceited. Uh, and can I let you know, dear Christian, um, that there are some weaknesses uh, that will not be removed from you anytime soon uh, because you are God's workmanship. In other words, you are God's ongoing project. And if God were to make you whole and, and self-dependent now, then you're going to tap yourself on the back and say, I made it on my own. I pulled up my own bootstraps. Here's my 10-step program on how to make it out. But when you're still struggling, when you're still down, when you're still dependent, it causes God to flex your muscles. The Bible says don't boast in your strength. Uh, boast in your weakness uh, because our weakness shows uh, our dependence on God where you are God brought you who you are God made you where you're going, God is going to carry you. We are too weak to make it on our own. And so we ought not boast in our own power and our own prowess and our own strength. But you've got to boast in the power of the Lord. Boast that you got identity issues. Boast that you have self-esteem issues. Boast that you struggle with addictions. Boast that you're a little overweight. Boast that you got a cigarette addiction or an alcohol addiction. Because it's in our weakness that we are made strong. You know the problem with the Christian churches in 2020 is that we're too strong. We're too strong that we're, we're too strong to be weak. And God is looking for some people in 2020 who are not going to walk around toting how great they are and how they made it on their own. God is saying that people that have the power are the ones who are weak before God. If you don't believe me, ask Moses. God said, I need to use you to deliver my people from Egyptian bondage. Moses said, I stutter and I'm, I'm a murderer. And, 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 but God says, take the shoes off your feet, Moses. The ground on which you're standing is holy ground. And if God could use Moses, he can use you. If God can use James and John, their nickname were sons of thunder. I mean, what kind, of, what kind of troublemakers must these folk have been that they were called sons of thunder? And if you really think about it, it wasn't that they were given trouble. It was probably their parents that were the thunder. They, they weren't sons of thunder because they were given the thunder. Maybe their mom and dad were the ones uh, that were given the thunder. And they say, hey, that's sons of thunder. That's lightning and, 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 and flood right there. Oh, yeah, but, but, but God still was able to use them. And guess what? If you fast forward to Revelation, when you make it to the new city, the new heaven and new earth, uh, there are going to be 12 foundations uh, and 12 apostles uh, and guess what James name is going to be there and John's name is going to be there because God has a way of taking imperfect people uh, to formulate his perfect plan uh, what about Peter he was hot tempered what about Gideon he was insecure what about Saul he was a persecutor but God used him to be a preacher what about Jacob uh, God took about 20 years getting Jacob right uh, and it's not until after 20 years uh, that Jacob finally said Lord uh, I will not let thee go until you bless me uh, what about Samson uh, who got his hair cut at the wrong barbershop uh, I want to let you know today uh, that when you realize your own spiritual inefficiencies and inadequacies uh, that's when God can use you your freedom and your deliverance uh, is in your honesty before God uh, your freedom is in telling the truth uh, about who you really are you are loved by God 
God. You are anointed by God. But the truth be told, you got some problems. And I got them too. You got some issues. And I got them too. You're struggling with stuff. And so am I. But be honest with yourself. You love God. But you tend to struggle from time to time. So the Bible is saying to us today, beloved, blessed are they that realize that they are poor in spirit. But we don't stop there. We don't just realize we're poor in spirit and say, well, this is just the way I am. Deal with me. No, they realize they're poor in spirit and they begin to seek after the transforming power of God in our lives. Realizing that only God can clean me up. Man, I'm such a wretch undone. Can't no program or no psychiatrist or psychologist fix me. While psychiatrists and psychologists are good and they deal with the mind, but only God can penetrate and deal with the heart. Only he can forgive. Only he can clean you up and place your feet on a solid rock. So how to receive, how to receive an eternal stimulus check. Two points and I'm done. Number one, you've, you've got to first recognize your own spiritual bankruptcy. And here's number two. You've got to receive, <laughs> this, this, this is going to make me shout today. You've got to receive the reward <laughs> that you didn't even earn. <laughs> ah, you see, when I got my stimulus check a few months ago, I was ecstatic. Because I got money I didn't earn. <laughs> I, I, I got money as a, as a result of a disaster, a pandemic. Uh, and, and, and when I got this money, this check that I didn't deserve, deserve, I was able to give my Honda Accord the tender loving care that she so much deserves. And, I, and as petty as it may seem, on Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020, I, I'm going to take that 1995 Honda Accord down to the polls and, and use the money that I used to fix that car. I'm going to drive that car to vote for Joe Biden uh, because I was grateful for my economic status. If I made too much money, I would not have been eligible. I wish I had a witness right about here for that check. But, but because I was poor economically, amen, because I was financially destitute, because I was in need, I got money I didn't deserve. Not bankrupt, but it had been, it had, if I had more money, I would have had more problems getting that check. But if, 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 if I was in a higher income bracket, I wouldn't have qualified for the $1,200 check. The Bible says, blessed are those who realize that they don't deserve salvation. Blessed are those who realize that they didn't earn salvation. The Bible says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who are they? They are the ones who realized that on our best day, they couldn't have earned access to eternity. Who are they? They are the ones who, have, who are spiritually bankrupt, that they had to beg for a reward. And I love how Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Look what Paul says. Paul says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that he through his poverty might be made rich. And I celebrate today the fact that Jesus paid the price that we couldn't afford to pay. They hug him high. They stretched him wide. For me he blessed and for me he died and I'm elephant elated today and peacock proud to announce that you and I one day will cash our eternal stimulus check and I'm not talking about $1,200 I'm talking about 12 gates into the city because the Bible says there are 12 gates three to the north and three to the south and three to the east and three to the west and I don't know why the 12 gates maybe each gate represents something you've overcome uh, in the natural uh, maybe some of us might have to go through about four of them gates uh, but I just want to give God praise uh, that because of the sacrifice of Jesus uh, you and I have access uh, into eternity uh, you and I have access uh, into salvation uh, you and I have access uh, to spend eternity with Jesus uh, and when I get to heaven uh, I I'm going to sing, sing, sing. I'm going to shout, shout, shout. I'm going to sing and I'm going to shout praise the Lord. When those gates are open wide, I'm going to sit at 
at my Jesus side. I'm going to sing. I'm going to shout. I'm going to sing. I'm going to shout. I'm going to sing. And I'm going to shout. Praise the Lord. I'm not talking about $1,200 today. I'm talking about 12 gates into the city. Ah, the, the call, the call for us today is to be poor in spirit. And the call to be poor in spirit is placed first for a reason. Because it puts the following commands into perspective. They cannot be fulfilled, play for me, they cannot be fulfilled by one's own strength but only by a beggar's reliance on God's power. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that no one mourns for others until they're first poor in spirit. No one is meek towards others until we have a humble view of ourselves. If you don't sense your own need and poverty, you will never hunger and thirst after righteousness. And if you have too high a view of yourself, you will find it difficult to be merciful to others. So today, God calls us for an attitude adjustment. And he says, you got to learn how wretched you are, how miserable you are, how poor and how blind you are. And it is then that you are ready to receive the kingdom of heaven. Today, you may be understood the sound of my voice. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. Why not make your calling an election sure today? Jesus says that you don't get good to come to God. You come to God to get good. And the truth of the matter is that every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. And today, Jesus says to you, I know you're messed up. Listen, Jesus... While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not a surprise that you got issues. It doesn't surprise Christ every time you sin. He died to cleanse you from your sins, to forgive you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so today, the invitation is given to you. If you want to accept Jesus in your life to adjust your attitude, realize that you can't do it by yourself. If you could do it by yourself, what is taking you so long? You would have done it already. The fact that you're in that position shows that you recognize your own weakness and the fact that you can't fix yourself. You need a power that is more powerful than your sin. And Jesus says, here I am, willing and able. And so, if you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, we ask you to write in the comment section. We want to reach out to you. We want to give you Bible studies. We want to pray with you. But you want to say, I want to say yes to Jesus. Why not do that today? Why not do that today? God is the joy and the strength of my life. Come on, everybody. God is the joy. God is the joy and the strength of my life. He removes. He removes all pain. Misery is right. Promise. Promise to leave.
top. God is the joy and the strength of my life. Come on, sing it at home if you need it. God is the joy. God, today we recognize that you are our all in all. When we were weak, you were strong. When we were down, you picked us up. You are the air we breathe. You are our daily bread. You are our living word. Today we just celebrate you for who you are. Oh, we thank you for what you've done, but what you've done don't compare to who you are. God, you love us despite, in spite of our sin picked us up, put our feet on a rock to stand, and for this we are eternally grateful. And our prayer is that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we, we pray that like Paul, you would give us grace to deal with the thorns in our flesh. And Lord, clean us up like only you can. We boast in you, because you are better to us than we could have been to ourselves. We pray for every solitary listener. We pray for your peace and your protection. We pray that you keep the hands of the enemy off of them. Let no virus come to their dwelling place. Let none under the sound of my voice lose their life for this pandemic. And when at last you shall return, I pray that all of us would be under the, under the sound of my voice, would be in that number when the saints go marching in. Because God, we love you. We just can't wait to see you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.